Sejam muito bem-vindos! Ciência e prática clínica, hoje em inglês, vocês topam? Science and clinical practice. Today in English. Are you with us? Oh, sejam bem-vindos! Eu vou fixar esse nosso comentário e essa é a nossa live de hoje. Sejam muito bem-vindos. Você que está me acompanhando todas as quartas-feiras lá no canal de vídeo, a gente vai dar sequência aqui numa série de lives nas próximas semanas. Essa é a primeira delas. E a gente começa com o pé direito. Nós começamos uh, numa discussão extremamente importante. Vamos falar de ciência e de prática clínica. Me conta aí de onde vocês estão falando e se nossa audiência está só em português ou se nossa audiência também está internacional. Ah, o pessoal do Avançado está por aqui, que bom! Essa é a hora que eu peço para vocês ó, clicarem aqui nessa setinha e mandar para os seus colegas dizerem que a gente está por aqui e que a gente vai discutir um conteúdo extremamente importante. Assim, o Instagram sinaliza que nós estamos na área. Cláudia Birro, você aqui, seja bem-vinda de BH. Fátima de Fortaleza, Alê de Londrina. Que delícia! Sejam muito bem-vindos. Hoje eu tenho uma convidada especial e a gente vai combinar o seguinte. A gente vai fazer nossa live em inglês para dar uma fluidez, uma certa sequência aí na nossa conversa. Mas eu vou estar por aqui, eu vou acompanhar vocês, vocês escrevam em português no chat, eu traduzo. E daí, cheers from Costa Rica, welcome! So good to see you! So we are gonna mix in between English and Portuguese, and you can make your questions on the chat. It could be in Portuguese and I will be able to translate and then we'll do back and forth trying to um, get a good conversation. Mas eu não vou traduzir tudo, tá bom? Não vou traduzir tudo, não vai dar para fazer tradução simultânea aqui porque a gente quer tentar dar uma fluidez. Eu vou chamar a minha convidada e apresentá-la para vocês. Mm, let me find her. I'm trying to find you, Julie. I saw you here. I saw Physiologic Toronto, but not iNeuro here. So you can request. Julie, if you are hearing me, you can uh, press this button here. It's a camera with a plus sign. And you can ask to get in. I have a request here, but it is your personal. It's your personal, um, your personal Instagram. I think it would be better for us to have your um, either iNeuro or Physiologic. Let me know because I can only see here Physiologic Toronto. You can type on the chat and I can see what's best for me, all right? I am on iNeuro, okay, let me see. I only see a request from Physiologic Toronto and from Julie, now only from Physiologic Toronto. I can't see the um, iNeuro, it's not appearing here. Do you think we can go for Physiologic Toronto? What do you think? You can type here on the chat and we can decide. They will wait for us. This audience is super good. They are gonna wait for us to decide what's best. Just let me know. A gente só tá decidindo aqui, gente, em qual um, Instagram que eu vou chamá-la, se vai ser no pessoal, se vai ser no da clínica ou se vai ser no... É, do, 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 do novo empreendimento dela. É... Let me see here again. I can see physiologic. 
and that's that's all I can see. Let me know here on the chat which which source should I include here. Enquanto isso, me diz aí, você já assistiu uma live em inglês? Fala aí nesse chat com a uh, Now I see I Nero join, so I might be able to add you. Escreve aqui no chat se você já assistiu uma live em inglês ou se essa vai ser sua primeira vez. Escreve aqui, primeira vez ou já assisti, Torriane. Agora sim. Now I can see you. I just send you a request. It's just a matter of accepting. Mm. Uh -huh. That's cool. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Good. Super good to see you. I will introduce you formally to my audience and then we can start like um, chatting and have this great conversation. So I have a long list here. I will bring you some of Uh, Julie's von Ham qualities, right? So Julie is a physiotherapist. She is the founder and the director of a Clinic Physiologic in Toronto. Um, she is also an adjunct lecturer in the Department of Physical Therapy in the University of Toronto, as well as an assistant clinical professor in the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University in Hamilton. She's an advanced IBIDA instructor, and she is the owner and founder of iNeuro Rehab, as you can see here. Um, And she works in the neurological physical therapy over 30 years. So she has 30 years of clinical experience. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. I'm glad I managed to get on. Yeah, I'm super glad. I told you, it's easy. Once you are in the correct profile, it's going to work. After English class, a live in English. That's good. So they are super excited to have a, a, a live in English. And I, I will tell them a few Portuguese things from your CV and then we can start our conversation. Então, gente, como vocês viram, a Julie, ela é fisioterapeuta, ela, é, ela tem experiência clínica há 30 anos, ela é instrutora de cursos avançados do Bobat, ela é fundadora e dona de uma clínica de reabilitação em Toronto e ela também é criadora, fundadora do I Neuro Rehab Here, que vocês podem ver e que eu recomendo que vocês sigam para que vocês aprendam um pouquinho toda terça. Tem o Tuesday, Teaching Tuesday, right? That's yep. what you have on Tuesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Julie. So, why, why do you think it's important to have a life with this title? Why we are trying to bring together clinical practice with research? Are we still far away from each other or are we becoming closer step by step what do you think about that um i think i would say that i think we're getting closer um i think um we've made a lot of progress i would say probably in the last 10 years um but i still think there is somewhat of a disconnect between how we undertake research um and how we actually do clinical practice um and i think we've got to have further dialogue um and more discussions ar around that so that the research that we do is really clinically relevant and do, do you think that this discussions should take place where? Where should we making those discussions? Because my feeling is that we are like discussing under the conference spots or like the networking between researchers and we are discussing far away on the other side of this um, scale or this timeline in between clinicians, in between people who really works like every day with the patient. So how could we create appropriate places or appropriate situations in which we can have those discussions, but bring all those 
actors in this discussion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good, I think it's a really good question. Um, I wouldn't say that um, I've got a really good answer. I wish I did have a really good answer. Um, I think, I think it's really difficult for the clinician to have a voice um, when it comes to, to the research agenda, because we tend to keep those worlds very separate. You're either a researcher, academic, or you're a clinician. And it's really difficult to bring those two worlds together. I think, um, you know, the position of, of a clinician scientist, for example, has worked really well in medicine, mm -hmm. um, but it hasn't worked for rehabilitation science. Um, you know, the number of funded positions for a clinician scientist is few and far between um, in, in, the, in the rehab science. And there isn't a really good model to support those positions, um, which, you know, could that change? Yes, hope, hopefully that will change. And hopefully it will change in, in my lifetime. Um, mm -hmm. but, but right now, um, it's, it's, it's a really challenging place. Um, I think the other challenge is how many clinicians go on and do sort of graduate degrees, such as PhDs, where you learn how difficult it is to actually run a research, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, a rehabilitation research um, study. It's not, it's not an easy, it's a, not an easy um, subject to really, yeah. to really research. And there's so many variables. Mm -hmm. um, but I th think the dialogue is starting. I think the dialogue is starting to change. I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we were very set on RCTs mm -hmm. and RCTs was the only way. Um, and while we're still, I think, in that, we still, we're still in that arena, um, I think the dialogue is starting, is starting yeah. to change. Mm -hmm. as, as we get more clinicians who have PhD um, and, and, and doctoral degrees, um, the, there is the ability to have a critical dialogue about yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what is the research really telling us? And more importantly, what is the research not telling mm -hmm. us? And why isn't it telling us that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Let me propose something. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to hear our audience just to understand whether they are clinicians, mm -hmm. researchers, or if they are clinicians with expertise in research, so they had yeah. like a PhD. Mm -hmm. Então escrevam aqui no chat, por favor, se você é clínico e atende pacientes todos os dias, se você é pesquisador ou se você se considera um clínico com uma formação, como por exemplo um doutorado, em que você teve a oportunidade de aprender sobre pesquisa. Só para a gente sacar um pouquinho a nossa audiência e a gente tentar trazer de vocês, e vocês podem escrever aqui no chat em português, não tem problema, vocês podem escrever aqui como é que vocês acham que deveria ser essa aproximação. Just to hear them and to get yeah. them a few yeah. like questions. But I think you... you you mentioned a very like important point. People like us, we are first clinicians and then researchers. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say for myself, but I think it's, it fits for you also. And then you let me know if not, but in different time points of my life, I put more efforts or weight under one role or another one. It was never possible to balance mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. being researcher and clinicians. Mm -hmm. For me, clinician, for me was not. So it was like, okay, like a wave in, in whether I was like putting more efforts and time because it's really hard to balance those two um, mm -hmm. roles in our life. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I am more a researcher, mm -hmm. but it's something rec recent because like last year I was 
highly or mainly clinician. So it was like, so in this way, it's hard to set up a place where I could do both and mm -hmm. could be well, like paid or well established in my position. So that's one problematic point, right? For sure. For sure. And that same, same for me, you know, I spent many years as a clinician and then went into postgraduate studies and masters and PhD. And it's, um, it's almost, I, I kind of described it to my fellow colleagues as I kind of have to take my research head off and put my clinician head on when I was going into the clinic <laughs> And then when I was going back to my doctoral work, I kind of had to take my clinical head off and put my research head back on, which was very disconcerting. And, and mm -hmm. also for me, um, the, cl the clinical work is what makes it all important. It's what, dr it's, it is what drives me. Mm -hmm. um, so why did I go down and do 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 a PhD was because I was frustrated with the evidence base. Mm -hmm. I was frustrated that the clinicians didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, but I think your point about how do you bring clinician and scientists together in rehab science, like I said, those funded positions, I, how do I do that and still make a living? Um, yeah. Because most of my research involvement right now is is gratis. It's un, it's unpaid. It's um, I do it on my own time, mm -hmm. and I I give up income because I choose to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm fortunate. I'm in a stage of my life where I I do have some flexibility to do that. But most people don't. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you know we all have to live and pay our rent and buy our food and <laughs> and it's not it's it's not a choice mm -hmm. and 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 so you know i'm i'm working at the moment to try and find how might i be able to fit more into a research agenda mm -hmm. um and balance clinical yeah. work and clinical work at the same time yeah one, one point that I think we are doing and we have to keep continue doing is that to help clinicians to translate science. Yep. That's one point. Yeah. We do in our courses, we do on social media. So like I do every day, I yep. do every day. I open like a um, answer box here every day. They can write their questions and can provide some insights or some reflections or some references. So I think yep. that's a way to help clinicians to start being connected with research. But that's not the way to, to help research mm -hmm. being near to the clinician. So we are mm -hmm. on one hand bringing clinicians forward in into the science direction, but should be this move into the research towards to the clinicians. And we see that this is really happening when we see, for example, mixed model researches mm -hmm. emerging, mm -hmm. like those interviews where the patient's opinion it's important. It's so nice, this movement we are seeing in the past maybe five years, how in the randomized control trials, they are like connecting the dots, including like um, patient-related outcomes. So I mm -hmm. think there is a move from both sides. What do you think about that? I do think I do think there is a move, and I do think there's a move to um, uh, to 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 make to make the RCT model more consistent with actual clinical practice. So making modifying the RCT model so that interventions are individualized to the to the individual patient. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I do, I do think that is happening. Um, I myself, first and foremost, is a qualitative researcher. And so, um, 
I kind of, um, it's, it's a challenge because in the rehab science, what do we value? We value, we value numbers. We yeah. value quantitative, we quantitative methods. Um, and so I really do feel that sort of, I'm a, I'm an outsider, um, mm -hmm. even in the research agenda, because, <laughs> you know, my world is qualitative research. Not any more you are an outsider because mm. nowadays the qualitative research they are being they are like highly valuable in the market because yeah. everybody wants to include them yeah 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 and i so maybe things are changing and because maybe yeah. i'm not in the research mm -hmm. world as much at the moment maybe you know i'm talking from past experience but i think the interesting thing you know, you, you said, you know, it's interesting they're doing patient interviews and stuff. And I, I think that is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my mentor, my professional mentor, sorry, my, my academic mentor, Professor mm -hmm. Cheryl, Cheryl Cott, who was my doctoral supervisor, um, you know, she was first and foremost when it came to, we really need to know what the patients think about mm -hmm. their interventions. Um, but when I did my study on um, understanding how therapists think about movement and what's important to them. There isn't any research on what do patients think about movement yeah. and what's, mm -hmm. what are the components of movement that are important to the, the, the patient or, or the client. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I think we still have a long ways to go to, to start to include that and if you take the exoskeleton study you know that i did mm -hmm. um and i interviewed i interviewed the patients who used the exo um now it was a it was a small study it wasn't it wasn't mm -hmm. a big it wasn't a big study but there was a lot, lot of information mm -hmm. from that that was really valuable information that really needs to go back to the people who are actually creating these devices. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I did that study, I, I was working alongside the engineers yeah. um, in terms of, can it do this or can it do that? Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and they were like, well, why would you want it to do that? Uh, and it's really unfortunate because they don't have the clinical background and so, you know, in the creation of these devices that really are going to be the future of rehabilitation, I think, you know, they're going to be adjuncts to rehabilitation. And if we don't embrace them, then I think we're going to miss a big component yeah. of mm -hmm. what they have mm -hmm. to offer. But in the generation of them, in the creation of them, there needs to be clinical input. Mm -hmm. There needs to be, you know, input from the clinicians and then yeah. the input from the clients and that's what my exo study was all about i interviewed the therapists and i interviewed the patients and uh -huh. and it was really it was really really interesting to hear what they what they had to say yeah um mm -hmm. but again how much of this then like for every 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 manuscript for every article you publish like what is the real reach mm -hmm. does that really mm -hmm. that does that article really get to the people that matter and that goes back to your first question is 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 how do we create this dialogue yeah. how do we we, how do we, we have these a, two worlds yeah we have a very good we have two questions here on the chat so i will translate a question from Melanie vieira and she is asking what would be like the perfect combination in between in between clinical practice and research how could we do this perfect match as we are discussing now this mismatch so how could we do this perfect match is this real like edp evidence-based practice elaine eu fiz a tua pergunta aqui para a gente ver como é que a gente tem aí uma possibilidade de combinação perfeita. Vamos ver aí o que a Julia acha disso. What do you think about that? Uh, It's a hard question. It's a little bit, I think, utopic. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't think we are going to have like a perfect combination. No, I think getting, you know, uh, um, striving for perfect is always, always 
the, the difficult thing, right? Um, and I would like to think, what's the best you can do at this moment in time? Yeah. Um, what I what I feel rehab science needs is funded clinician scientist positions, um, because a clinician scientist is able to take um, the real world clinical mm -hmm. issues that we have mm -hmm. on a day to day basis, and then use their science research knowledge to develop studies that mm -hmm. address those issues but those you know those issues are big issues right yeah. and that's then they're, they're not any one study and so and that's the challenge if your clinician scientist position is revolves around a grant um for, for a study there's no there's no career um um what's the word um, security because yeah. when that grant ends you're out of a job yeah. Um, yeah and so how do you then get people to invest and um, this situation it's not um i would say homogeneous across the world because i cannot see i do not know one single like research clinician in brazil for example mm. I, I don't know one single, I, I, I've never heard about an opening position in which they were requiring, they are always requiring, requiring like um, faculty to mm -hmm. conduct research and do research at their uh, laboratories. So it's, it's most of where like good science comes, but not necessarily the most useful science in mm -hmm. the clinical practice mm -hmm. so this this option you are providing right now and we have like here in the u.s as i'm living here right now we have a few positions and we have a few like nih grants dedicated to research clinicians right <laughs> it's not a lot it's not the majority but we have so this would be a good way and needs to be spread around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I th the, like, like the US, I think there are, there are some funded clinician scientist positions, but they are, they're few and far between in re I would say in rehab science. Um, I think um, there are models that are sort of evolving where, um, clinician scientist positions are sort of funded through, um, you know, private paying programs mm -hmm. um, and a, a percentage of the funds can then be allocated towards funding, funding research through those, mm -hmm. through those clinicians. So I think, you know, I think we're some maybe on the cusp of, of different models starting to, starting to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not it, it's it's not in a, it's not in at the ground level it's not in at the ground level yet it would be you know my dream would be for every large sort of department rehab mm -hmm. science department there would be a clinician scientist within that within that within that department mm -hmm. that is affiliated with a university, but is affiliated also with yeah. a, reha a rehab yeah. science, rehab scientist, yeah. um, mm -hmm. a rehab science, um, mm -hmm. program. Um, but yeah, this would that be would, that, ideal. that would, that would be ideal, but then where do the funds come from? Yeah. For, yeah. For, for that. Sure. And it forces the current model forces you to make a choice. You, the current model is if you want to do research, you really have to take a full time academic position. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and it, and I, I mean, I did that very briefly during my, during my doctoral work. Um, but for me, um, I really felt that I still, I still needed to participate in clinical practice to really mm -hmm. understand the problem because it's very, easy to quickly become disconnected yeah. from from the clinic from the clinical world yeah. Um, yeah. and and so then you know how do, how do those studies mm -hmm. 
yeah how do your how does your research program remain completely embedded within yeah. within clinical practice that that is such a challenge one thing that when we met i think we met in 2010 when i or maybe one year before or something like that when i just started um my when i was like about being qualified as a basic instructor and um at that time i think you and i or like i thought i was okay i think only me and maybe two or three more people here they are clinicians and they have like phd you mm -hmm. got your phd in 2016 16. right yeah. yeah so it was a long time ago but you were in a certain way involved in in research or something i i, I have this memory but it was like rare very rare to have clinicians with phd nowadays mm -hmm. it is not mm -hmm. and this is not rare across like, like globally it's mm -hmm. something that it is increasing mm -hmm. so this is mm -hmm. something like showing that clinicians they want to be more involved or at least they want to have the flavor of having the challenge and the success of doing research mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. one thing we have another thing here. I thought it was a very nice question. It's from Viviane Mancini, and she's asking, in your opinion, what should clinicians, like what skills clinicians must have in order to be complete, in order to be like a clinician that although doesn't have research background, could make the more useful way of research in their clinical practice. So what should be the skills a good clinician should have to be connected with research? I think for a clinician to be really connected with research is they have to have an ability to critically read. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the problems of the systematic reviews and the meta-analysis is these, these summaries of an extensive body of work um, and the clinicians just accept um, what is said in the systematic review or what is said in the meta-analysis or what is said from a particular paper rather than um, critically evaluating Waiting them, mm -hmm. and there are mm -hmm. there re there are really good tools out there for clinicians to use on how to critically evaluate both quantitative and qualitative research, mm -hmm. um, and to to help yourself become familiar with those tools, which is hard, right? Because yeah, um, no one has any extra time. Um, yeah. I would say clinicians are working flat out. Um, mm -hmm. they're trying and they are to burning stay, out. And they are it's burning so out. so common now. They are yeah. burning out with all documentation and everything they exactly. have to do, one patient after the other. Yeah. It's been super hard, right? Yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's so... <laughs> bless you. I think Thank it's you. such a challenging environment to be in because they're trying to be the best clinician they can be. Yeah. for their patients and at the same time they're trying to stay abreast of the research and the evidence um i would also say um if you if if you are pushing your clinical practice and you are participating in postgraduate education mm -hmm. and you are having critical discussions with either with your fellow colleagues or even in a research group or however the that may be i would say you really are, are pushing at the limits of the evidence and for me i like to think of myself as a clinician that practices evidence informed practice um and i don't really subscribe to evidence based practice because th we have so much we have so many gaps in the evidence. Mm -hmm. If we were only to practice evidence-based practice, 
we would leave out a whole group, um, many different groups of patients because there is no evidence for them. Yeah. So does that, does that mean yeah. we shouldn't treat them? No, <laughs> we have, to, we have yeah. to do the best we can with mm -hmm. the knowledge that we have. Mm -hmm. But if we as clinicians are pushing the limits in terms of our own knowledge, um, both professionally and academically, I would say that we are almost ahead of the evidence. Um, and a lot of the questions that we are asking um, are, are very specific to patient presentations yeah. and um, movement problems, mm -hmm. but all of our all of our research is based around a medical diagnosis. Yeah. And for me, yeah. that is a fundamental problem. Problem, yeah. I just want to make sure if they got this idea. So I will briefly speak in mm -hmm. Portuguese because this is, mm -hmm. I think, it's crucial. Eu não sei se vocês sacaram, gente, o quanto a Julie está pontuando aqui que Primeiro, se a gente for dizer assim que a gente faz prática baseada em evidências e somente faz PBE, a gente vai deixar um percentual de pacientes sem tratamento. E por que, que a gente vai deixá-los sem tratamento? Porque não existem evidências suficientes que dão suporte para várias condições de pacientes, várias características de pacientes, que são aqueles pacientes que são excluídos dos estudos, que não estão dentro do critério de elegibilidade dos estudos. Então a gente vai ter que usar o nosso melhor conhecimento para ajustar e adaptar essas situações. E um grande problema é que os estudos estão baseados em diagnóstico médico. Então, o estudo é daquele paciente que teve AVC e tem essas características, mas a condição médica é AVC. E nós, como fisioterapeutas, não tratamos a condição médica. Então, os estudos deveriam mais estar focados no diagnóstico cinesiológico funcional. So Yeah, I think this, this comment, it, it makes super sense, especially when we get into those, I, I have a community and we have, inside our community, we have clinical case discussions. Mm -hmm. And most commonly, the videos and the discussions we have are about the patients who are not under the eligibility criteria in the randomized control trials. So particularly are the cognitive impaired patients, the perceptually impaired patients, all with um, um, joint problems all over the place or cardiac problems attached with rep respiratory and mobility problems. So they are all over the place combinated with different situations. And those are the real patients that they have in their clinic. Mm -hmm. So clinicians are facing the challenge to treat patients. And when we go to PubMed and try to find an evidence that could support at least like motherly speaking, my interventions, I cannot find. And that's why they get nope. frustrated. Absolutely. And that's why right. they come into the community and say, I don't know what to do with this patient. So right. that's a big problem. How yeah. could we solve or how could we like have insights to solve this problem, Billy? So for me, um, I think, I feel very strongly that every clinician should know how to do a single subject research design because if do you think we should learn in in our school I in think the we should school? learn in, we should learn in our schools okay. we should know we should know how to implement a single subject research design it's not it's not it's not impossible to do in clinical practice does it need time need time yes does it need preparation yes Does it need planning? Yes. Um, but we know from the evidence that single subject research designs can demonstrate the effects of interventions. And if we could group a number of single subject research designs together, say 10, then mm -hmm. you can do statistical analysis on the outcomes if you have a similar patient presentation. So I think for me, um, mm -hmm. 
what I feel needs to happen in the rehabilitation sciences is one, we need to better educate our clinicians on how to do a single subject research design, um, which is not, you know, it's not rocket science and it's mm -hmm. been out there a long time. And there is a good evidence base around single subject research designs. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also need to, as a profession, particularly the physiotherapy profession, we need to begin to have a conversation about how do we actually describe our patients' movement problems mm -hmm. and how do we stratify those movement problems because that's what we are treating. Yes, mm -hmm. our patient yeah. might have had a stroke. They may have had an incomplete spinal cord injury. They may have multiple sclerosis. They may have had a traumatic brain injury. But what is their movement yeah. problem? How mm -hmm. do we describe that? And how do we then group those patients similarly? Because then we could have, we could put five single subject research designs together and do an, a statistical analysis of those. No matter their uh, health condition. So right. we could have patients with the same movement diagnosis, no yes. matter their health conditions. And then we could start understanding from our perspectives as we are the experts in movement analysis, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's I also, a, a good I also, point. I also think we need to pay more attention to what the client is really wanting. What the what 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 is the client? What are their, their goals of of mm -hmm. rehabilitation? And I don't know about you, but in in my clinical practice, clients come in through the door because they don't have any balance, or they want to walk better, mm -hmm. or they want to improve the use of their upper limb. You know, if I'm if I was going to group patients, those would be the three big groups. Mm -hmm. um, some patients want to do both. And balance, yeah. in, balance intersects all of those, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what, what is really important to them? And so while I think we need single subject research designs, we also need to start in undertaking more qualitative research yeah. around, you know, mm -hmm. what, are, what, are, what are the things that are actually important to our clients? Um, because does them does their six minute walk test, is that really important to them? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so in a single subject research design, yes, you need your quantitative outcomes. Yeah, sure. Yes. But what are some of those, what are some of those participation outcome measures mm -hmm. that perhaps mm -hmm. should be included? Mm -hmm. So, so then, Let's and I, and I will bring this in Portuguese because I, I think this is another very important aspect just to be sure that they are following us. But so then we are claiming and we have strong like research claiming claiming on that in the past maybe four or five years saying that we need to start including in the research more qualitative mm -hmm. data, more qualitative like questionnaires or measures. Um, and there was a comment here right on top. I will not recall it, but somebody said, okay, I read a paper from Julie and she was mentioning about the importance of quality measurements. And that's why we are not saying we are not going to use six minute walk test instead mm -hmm. of something else. But we are saying, okay, it would be super important to combine and quantity and quality um, measurement. Mm -hmm. Então, só para saber se vocês sacaram em português esse, essa questão do quanto os clinicians deveriam aprender a rodar um, single case subject, subject design um, estudos de casos é, nas suas próprias clínicas e a gente deveria aprender isso na faculdade. Além disso, a gente tem que se acostumar com a ideia de combinar medidas quanti com medidas quali. There is a good comment here from Jaco Lomera and he is mentioning or she, I don't know, I'm sorry, 
um, about the core sets using ICF and trying to select based on that. But nowadays we have um, a few more possibilities under the umbrella of the qualitative outcome. A few, I'm not saying I am satisfied. I don't know if you are, probably no, but no. we have a few more options that could be included if we talk about like go attainment scale, if we mm -hmm. talk about motor activity log, if we talk about, so we have a few more options, right? Yes, and I also think um, technology is now getting to the point where, um, and I hopefully, you you know, over the next decade, even more so, where we are going to be able to have, um, you know, me measures, gadgets that we can apply um, that track movement more closely, that can track trajectories mm -hmm. and can track rotations and, and can start to record variability in mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. that we can't... Um, a six minute walk test doesn't give us right yeah. um yeah and and again that comes down to what's important is it speed at the um to the detriment of the quality of the movement or is it the quality of movement and we don't really know is it only clinicians that are interested in the quality of the movement or is it is it the clients mm -hmm. as well as, yeah. a clin as a clinician yeah. i would say the clients are interested in the quality yeah. of their movement. Because... This is common. They, right. they. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, in my in my clinical practice, I would say this is quite common. My patients say, "I don't like the way I walk. walk. I don't like the statics mm -hmm. of my walk. Mm -hmm. walk. Like everybody keeps looking at me, so I would like to walk." under a more normal pattern so right. that's something they are also claiming it's something that we usually like put as a priority in our treatment but i may say it's more common also to to come this uh, complaint from the from the patients yeah. is it the same yeah. for you yeah it's the same for me but we don't see it in the evidence base so no much. we don't because we mm -hmm. because we don't yeah. ask the question we don't ask we don't ask them yet yeah. or you know it's not it it's not a large body of evidence mm -hmm. you know walking speed there's a large body of evidence yeah walking distance there's a large body of evidence yeah. what do patients want about out of uh gate interventions i wouldn't say there's a large body of evidence there um mm -hmm. is it is, is there some yes of course but i think i think we need to grow i think we need to grow that evidence base and mm -hmm. so that we're not I, I i still feel rehab interventions and research is all about what we clinicians want what we researchers want and you know Really, it needs to be about the individual patient. Okay. And so we are missing this point. Although think, we think. have developed under the clinician's perspective, we have developed strongly under the research perspective. We are closer than we were in the past decade, but we are still missing the patient yeah. piece, right? So yeah. that's something I very think, important. You know, whereas if, if you look at it from a hierarchical point of view and you put research at the top, I think clinicians have a lack of voice in, 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 in the academic arena. And I think patients have a lack of voice in the clinical and the research, and research. The research yeah. arena. Yeah. Um, it's a start changing, but yes, yes, there is maybe, it should be on both sides. It shouldn't be um, drawn or demonstrated in a hierarchical way. Yeah. So I think the, circles around the EBP interaction would be is ideal uh, mm -hmm. in, as a matter of fact but it needs to have like those overlaps and real overlap interactions in between the circles right? absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah I'm not sure if I got this question. I will read it for you because I'm not sure let me let's figure out what they are meaning here. So what do you think would be the ideal way existing or imaginated for clinicians to stay 
current with emerging research mm -hmm. that they can or copy oh okay or copy oh so how maybe it's something like how the clinicians could be updated and could be on top of current evidence trying to apply in their clinical practice um socks for souls ca let me know if that's the question and then i can maybe um state in a different way let's discuss about that yeah. i think um, I think it's a good question. Um, how, if you look at, if you, if you look at many clinicians, if they don't have an adjunct or an affiliate um, position in a university PT program, OT program, rehab science program, they don't have any library access. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is, incredibly difficult for them to actually even access the literature um i i it's one of the reasons why i started i knew rehab is um it's you know in response to clinicians saying you know um how how do i how do i get access to the research and mm -hmm. how do we how do we clinically interpret that mm -hmm. that that, mm -hmm. ev that evidence base yeah and what are the important points and what are the important questions that, that are that are remaining and i think there are you know like you and 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 me we have a, a i think we've a maybe unintentionally uh taken on a role of that clinical interpret interpretation yeah. Um, yeah. because we're teaching at a clinical level, but we're also really sort of embedded in the research agenda and in, and in the science, um, mm -hmm. and the academic arena. Um, and so, you know, through I Neuro Rehab, I'm trying to bring those two things together and disseminate, disseminate that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully over time mm -hmm. we grow those we grow those numbers we grow the yeah. number of people who are who are taking on that role and i think it's important for the clinicians to be to critique who they are listening to um yeah and um to critique the information that's coming to them because it's very easy to take one side or another mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and i think it i think it behoves us um in the positions that we're in to present to present the evidence in a way that can be clinically translated but also acknowledges where the gaps are and mm -hmm. um, and what does this what does this evidence really really tell us um mm -hmm. and how can i how can I translate that in evidence into my actual, mm -hmm. actual clinical mm -hmm. practice? I want to add two points to this discussion, answering this questions, this question. I don't know if they are still here or if they left, but I think nowadays it's not that hard to have access to the papers, to the research to the articles as it used to be 10 or 15 years ago mm -hmm. nowadays we have other options maybe not exactly that legal one but we have different sources trying to get at the papers in our hands in a timely manner so they were published straight this week and I can have it even if they are not open access. We have mm. SciHub, we have ResearchGate, we have the emails of the authors and we can email them and ask. For, so we have strategies. I don't like to have this excuse to the clinicians for not being able to get into the update um science because nowadays we have other options when we used to to go to the libraries 
to request a paper to pay. I used to pay for the papers. Mm -hmm. And it was so common like 20 years ago. No, nowadays it is a totally different. Also for those who are not English speakers, they also can't use this as an excuse because we have Google Translator. It's not perfect, it's not, but it will help you to get the sense of that. So don't use it as an excuse because it's not. The, th the second point that I would like to add is clinicians. I know it is a hard schedule around their work. I know that. But they need to fight for time for update knowledge in their work schedule. And hospitals, rehab centers, the private clinics or whatever, they need to recognize the importance of maybe one journal club discussion every two weeks. So it would be like two papers discussion every month. So something like that, that could uh, make them aware what is new, what is emerging and creating opportunities for them uh, to, to be updated. Also, when they have like to have their CEU, CEU credits, so they have to be like in the conferences, in, in, the, um, in the courses or attending some courses. Therefore, it's another source of being updated. So I think it's an, a combination of strategies that could make them on top of not everything that's being released because it's impossible to be on top of that, but at least in some topics with the majority, majority of your clients, I would say, so if you mostly treat Parkinson's, just try to be updated on that, that topic. So that's something my might help the clinicians what do you think um yes and no i yes <laughs> i think i i agree with you that there is a lot there's a lot more options now mm -hmm. but i do think i i know i take for granted the fact that i can just get on um my library resource from two different universities so if i can't get yeah. if i can't get it at that one i'll go to the other one right and um if you're a sole practitioner for example and mm -hmm. you're, you're you're working in the community as a sole practitioner um and you don't take students and so therefore you don't have any affiliation um it's it, it's it's a lot it's harder hard. to mm -hmm. I see. to 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 get that to get mm -hmm. and also because you're not in the academic arena so much you don't know you don't know what, what's coming you don't know what's necessarily coming out and so you don't know what to look for what to read uh, yeah i see that's and, a good point and also um also what do you believe mm -hmm. right and this is where I, I think the ability to um critically analyze is something that is so important as part of our education Mm -hmm. um, everybody should come out with the ability to um, critically analyze a paper so that they can truly understand what the researchers did or didn't do. Um, because I'm on, a, I'm on teaching a lot of courses and, and therapists will come up to me and say, well, this paper says this. And mm -hmm. I said, yes, but what did they actually do? Mm -hmm. And then... Mm -hmm. You know, it's not enough just to read yeah, the discussion section. Um, yeah. if, if, if you are going to, if you're going to hang your hat, we have this saying in English, if you're going to hang your hat on a particular paper, then you yeah. need to be, you need to fully understand what were the patients, how were they selected, what was mm -hmm. the inclusion and an exclusion criteria, and what was actually done. And for me, the big missing piece in our research is what are the theoretical foundations of the interventions mm -hmm. and what is the clinical reasoning process that was undertaken for those interventions for Good. that person? Um, and yeah. 
and so it's that, that it's that critical dialogue it's that oh i never really thought about i never mm -hmm. really thought about it in that way um mm -hmm. is often what therapists are saying are saying to me yeah. and they say well now you say that now i understand and now i understand mm -hmm. why you have difficulty with this particular paper or yeah. not um mm -hmm. and 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 it goes back to the single subject research design you need to have an under if you're going to be treating a patient and doing a single subject research design for example you need to understand the body of evidence around yeah. that kind of patient presentation because you need to discuss that in your introduction yeah. um then and and so it's when you've got what, seven patients slated on your on your caseload at a minimum in a day mm -hmm. yeah and you it have will rest be of, super hard to do it's that so yeah. Yeah. Hard yeah. yeah because because I agree. I agree with you. I wish there was dedicated time where every program or whatever said, you know what, you get two hours a week to sit and review this mm -hmm. research or these articles as a group mm -hmm. and, and discuss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, in private practice, that happens on our own time, right? Yeah. That happens when the patients have all gone home and yeah. you give up and, and you give up an evening or you give up and you've had to have done the work before you've had yeah. to have read all of the articles yeah. and mm -hmm. it's, you know, do I, it's not going to be, it's not easy. It's not going to be do easy. I believe, yeah. Do I believe that it's important? Yes. I believe yeah. that it's, that it's important. Yeah. Um, not necessarily everybody shares my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I agree. There's a comment here from Josie this and then she's a, uh, a great researcher here in Brazil, uh, there in Brazil. And she's saying, now we have much more ways and tools for having access to a wide uh, scientific literature, but also many people got used to easily received information or receive information from the practice. So something like, okay, I have this bunch of research now available and I can I, I don't know, number one, how to deal with this amount of information, mm -hmm. although it's mm -hmm. accessible. And number two, I was not trained in a way to actively interpret and look for the information is missing in my clinical practice and extract this from the research yeah. perspective. So I am used to receive in a more passive way of learning. So mm -hmm. it depends on how we were, how it was our PT school, but I would say my PT school, I was mainly passive receiving mm. information at that time nowadays we have such a, a great different um teaching uh, style teaching learn and all those active learning um process to run in, in in the pt school but that's something quite new i would say in the past maybe five ten years we are starting doing this yeah. with our students. students so we might see a change in the next generation when they are as clinicians settle in their hospitals or in their own private practice but with a more active um search perspective and also with a more a critical background right. to interpret and extract information. So we might see a difference in the next years in the clinician's perspective. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would agree with uh, the, the researcher there that, that, that um, made that comment. I would say that we're in sort of an information overload era right now. Um, and not all information is valuable information. And so it's that capacity to be able to discern what is relevant for your clinical mm -hmm. practice and also what is good science and what's not so good science. Um, you know, when I went to school, 
you know, was well before the era of evidence-based practice, let's put it that way. Um, and, you know, yes, we had lots of textbooks, but did we have access to, you know, journals and stuff? We went to the stacks, yes, and we pulled articles and whatever. Um, it was it was much more challenging in in those <laughs> in those days than it, you know yeah. na- than it is, than it is now, for example. But like your your colleague said, it's the challenge is is being able to sift through all of that data mm-hmm. and pull out and extract the relevant, pertinent, important information. Yeah. yeah. And and also ask the questions of what doesn't this research tell me? Yeah. It's not just mm-hmm. I think the passive recipient is much more, okay, what's it telling me? Um yeah. the the active person is, okay, I understand what it's telling me, I understand how they came to those conclusions, um, but what isn't it telling me as Mm -hmm. well? And then seeking research that maybe looks at those questions, um, helps you sort of, sort of dig down. But I, I don't know about you, but you know, when I take a subject on as a, as a as a research subject or a topic that I'm preparing for a course or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, you end up going down a, a rabbit hole, um, and there's this warren underneath, you know, in the ground, which is that e library, and before you know it, you've got, you know, oh that looks really interesting. I'll download that one. That one looks really interesting. Before you know it, you've got sort of, you know, 150 PDFs um, yeah. in a folder. And then you've got to mine through that data. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think as a clinical educator, I think that's what perhaps the clinicians and the academics don't understand that we are actually doing. Um, Perhaps because we don't explain it very well and Mm -hmm. perhaps because we don't, um, that kind of information doesn't make it into journals um or uh, <laughs> yeah. or it doesn't make it into into sort of large scale conferences but that i would say that is the role of the clinical in- educator um is to take take that body of evidence and distill it um yeah. digest and, distill, and, distill and, and then in a way and, yeah and then yeah. translate and translate it into a way that can be utilized in cl- in clinical mm-hmm. practice mm-hmm. and i don't and i think that's a really challenging and time consuming um job <laughs> yeah it is it is uh we have a good question here it's also a great great researcher in brazil her name is dr sandra aloshi and she is writing, I understand the purpose of having single subject design uh, for the clinicians as a tool to be updated and as a way to get in, in a deeper study of my own patient. However, mm-hmm. it is a dangerous purpose because it can reinforce that common statement coming from the clinicians. Oh, okay, in my clinical daily practice, this works. Because this is not a good statement to go forward because it goes against to what we understand as evidence-based practice. So she is trying to wait and, okay, seeing the positive aspects, of running a single subject case design in the clinical practice, but this would allow clinicians to have maybe an excuse. Uh, um, I'm not what sure that I. About that? Mm, I'm not sure I agree. Um, if you, if you, um, if you aspire to the hierarchy of evidence, I'm. Um, in the the randomized control trial is the gold standard, then yes, 
your your the your perspective on a single subject research design is is that it's poor quality ev poor quality evidence right mm -hmm. however if you critique the randomized con uh, controlled trial methodology um, mm -hmm. in terms of its alignment with clinical practice it doesn't align with clinical practice and if you if you do a single subject research design well the person who is providing the interventions is not providing is not undertaking yeah. the outcomes um and so therefore there is um there there, there is some, some control of bias in the fact that the person providing the clinician providing the interventions is not the one doing the the outcome measurement um mm -hmm. and so therefore we try and we aim to to separate those things so it doesn't necessarily say that it reinforces poor practice um mm -hmm. because if you, you have an independent evaluator hopefully that independent evaluator is independent Mm -hmm. um also um we are not in rehab sciences we're not in the um we're not in the business of treating groups we're in the business of treating individuals and so fundamentally our research is in the business of treating groups and so therefore or this disconnect between um, the research and what I actually do clinically in practice, don't, those two worlds don't collide. Um, and so if you can, if you, you can one, use a single subject research design to, to highlight a clinical question, mm -hmm that clinical question can then be taken into an RCT, um, a randomized control trial um, design where- Like a pra the pragmatic more a randomized pragmatic. control trial. Yes, uh -huh. where the interventions are individual to the individual and they yeah. are recorded as such and they are documented and journaled as such as mm -hmm. along with the clinical reasoning that's a very different randomized controlled trial yeah to the ones mm -hmm. that we're currently doing for the most yeah. part i'm talking yeah. generally i'm talking yeah. generally here and and if and you I, take those rcts like just an example from what you were saying uh excite trial leaps trial i care trial lots of those large rcts that we had in the past like 10 years all of them did not succeed in showing differences between interventions. So all interventions are good enough. We'll provide patients uh, uh, improvement mm -hmm. in the outcome measures. So in this way, what you are saying is that the single subject design created based on a clinical reasoning, which is individualized and take patient's movement diagnosis as a priority, then this could, after being conducted in a very well way, this could serve and after being published because it doesn't help if it was conducted but not published. Published, yeah. This, yeah, this will create a foundation, a background for them, researchers who are hired as researchers could develop a more like pragmatical RCT and then go into like large scale, lots of participants and then running a, a clinical reasoning which could allow individualized treatment in the RCT. Yeah. That's, that's, and I, that's cool. Yeah. And, and, and there are scientists out there that are doing that. Um, I just don't think it's the norm for rehab science mm, at the yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. And also um, you need, you need large, you need large amounts of funds to run those studies. Um, and so you're, you're competing 
um, for for grants. And when you consider yeah. about one in t one out of ten grant applications gets funded, mm -hmm. you might have the best idea in the world, um, but if you can't get it funded, you can't do the study. Yeah. Um, and 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 this is what you know. Uh, you know, this is what researchers are up against all the all the time. And I think maybe clinicians don't appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, they don't necessarily appreciate you know the five years of work that have gone into writing the the grant proposal to actually submit it and resubmit it and resubmit it and resubmit it which is incredibly time consuming and someone's got to someone's got to do it in order to get the funds to do the study so you know i don't mm -hmm. want to i don't want to come off as you know um I only see the clinician's perspective. I truly yeah. under I truly understand what the researchers mm -hmm. and scientists are up against, as well. And it's not. I'm not suggesting that their world is any easier than ours. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. It's just they have different problems to what clinicians yeah. clinicians have. I just would love to see over the next 10 years that those that those worlds come closer together come closer rather together. than them yeah. rather than them operating in individual sort of silos uh, where those worlds don't mm -hmm. don't collide yeah we have a comment from sandra loshi and it's like kind of a conclusion it goes straight forward in the same direction as was you, at, at what you just said. So the translational science should include clinicians to point at the barriers and facilitators to implement the results of that uh, research in clinical practice. So bringing, and nowadays in the pediatrics field, yeah. they are doing this. Are. And here, uh, I think we have a very nice person here to represent the pads. I don't know if she's here, Ana Paula Nogueira. She's a, a board instructor in the pediatric field. And um, they are including parents yes. in, in developing the, 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 the research design. So prior research is done. So in the planning process, parents are there just to oversee and give them their perspective. So this is super mm -hmm. like innovative and it's been doing, I, I've, I've, I've not seen this in the adult field yet, but it will come, it will come. It's a matter yeah. of time. Yeah, I mean, same here, it Pete's here. We have um, um, a scientist at our pediatric facility here in Toronto. Dr. Virginia Wright, and she's doing, she's doing, she's doing the same, the same kind of stuff, and also doing very, mu very much the pragmatic research in in her in her research. She doesn't, she doesn't um, limit what the clinicians are doing. You know, you're not, you don't have to just give this package of interventions to this uh -huh. this group of patients. The 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 intervention is much more individually tailored and it's That's documented mm -hmm. and um uh it's it's you just end up with a lot of data <laughs> yeah um, yeah for um, sure and, but that's good from the research perspective we can have like primary analysis and then we can have secondary analysis and another secondary analysis uh, data set this would offer us possibilities to continue publishing our research which is yes. good and also offering different perspectives from the same set of data collection yeah so that, that that's so it will take longer yes it will take longer to take advantage of those results because it will take longer to get them published but it is a very nice way to bring the patient's perspective more on the table when planning a research, not after it's done, right? right. And then providing resources for the clinicians to choose how they are gonna uh, utilize in their clinical practice. I also, that, I, I also think we could take a leaf out of 
um, sort of how do they run um, neurosurgical um, trials? Um, because you, you can't do those as randomized control trials. And they are, they are taking the individual patient from a neurosurgical perspective, from an intervention perspective. And so they're running, um, running these, these, these trials quite, quite different, quite differently. And I think rehab science could borrow from that too. Um, I think, um, you know, I, it, was, it was interesting. I was at a conference um, and it was, an, it was a neurosurge conference and there wasn't one RCT that was presented um, at, the, at the conference because they don't treat groups. <laughs> they, treat the <laughs> they treat the individual person. And it was really quite refreshing. Uh -huh. um, the, there was a whole bunch of, you know, neurosurgeons around me who were not, who were very open to other methodologies because they don't, don't treat a group. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, I think rehab science jumped on the bandwagon of the, of the RCT as being the gold standard uh -huh. for determining effectiveness. But, you know, there are so many variables in mm -hmm. rehab science in terms of, um, you know, um, sleep and motivation and nutrition. The, envi and the environment and nutrition em and emotion. Um, emotion and adequate, uh, appropriate personal support. Um, mm -hmm. all of those things, yeah. um, you know, the family environment, the, mm -hmm. all of these things are so critical to the outcome of the individual patient. And I think we strip all of those away in research, um, because there's so many, there's so many confounding variables, but, yeah. but in clinical practice, that's what we deal with with that's and, what we are dealing with yeah and our home program the, yes. our interactions with the family our meetings with the family members yes. i don't know how often you do that but we do like very often those are the situations that express or reflect exactly what we do in clinical practice and we cannot do in an rct we, right. we can like have a, a family meeting, meeting or considering that this is exactly the day that we set the outcome measure of the final results it was like a bad night but there is a counterbalance in between this because we can say okay that's why we need lots of people to be included in this sample size that's mm -hmm. why we need like large samples that's why we need like eligibility criteria that make the groups equal in the baseline and make them so yes we do that's what we do but if this research come is coming from a clinical practice perspective or will bring an answer that is claimed for the clinicians, it will be much more useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know about you, but I often say the patients that do really well from a recovery perspective aren't necessarily the patients that have the most potential. They're the patients that have the most yeah. supportive motivated environment yeah. I agree of, with you. A, a, around them and yeah. have a program that can be integrated within their daily life on a 24 seven um, yeah. approach. Those are the patients that do yeah. really well. I have patients- I would add living in, uh, in developing country, I would add something else, another Another ingredient, I don't know if you agree and if you say this in your country, but in Brazil, yes, you were right. The most supportive family and the most like enriched environment are those ones in which the patients get recovered fast, better. But, but 
the patients who have the possibility to have the most economical status yeah unfortunately yeah to have access access yeah. to orthosis technology pt yes. ot speech language yeah it, it's it's a pity to yeah. say that and, but it is a reality and i w i don't think that that's just you know part of the developing world i think that is across the board in terms of you know all you know, as I travel around the world, you know, mm -hmm. teaching in, 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 in different countries, access and length of stay and intensity of practice um, are challenging no matter where you are in the world. Where you are in the world. So yeah. I would agree. Yeah. I, I would agree that, I, yes, I totally agree with you in terms of, you know, for those environments or, or countries where there isn't any, any sort of public access to rehab, mm -hmm. um, I think they have even greater challenges, but I would say there's challenges around the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that, that's a, a, a big challenge. And thinking about having science, we are like, one hour and 30 minutes discussing and we could continue doing this mm -hmm. for a long time. Uh, but I, I would say, I would say in order to bring research closer to the clinicians, it would also be important to have environmental factors and personal factors collected in the sample su sample characterization yeah. so i yeah. would love to have this information when i read that table including time after stroke sex or type mm -hmm. of stroke <laughs> i would rather also reading okay maybe income annually income or um number of hours yes or number of weeks they receive yes. um, um, rehabilitation after their onset and and so on like yep. those aspects we see in our practice but we do not see very often I've never seen in fact by the way in the research reading yep. right yeah no and I, and I would also add to that is um, what is what is the socioeconomic cost of not doing rehab yeah. We, we, uh, I don't think we, I don't think we've even touched on, we've, we've even touched on that because, you know, is it, we have, um, you know, we're very fortunate here in Ontario, in Canada, we have a, an excellent program that provides assisted devices such as wheelchairs and walkers and um, mobility aids, et cetera, et cetera where the government funds 75% of, of the, of the device. Wow. Um, and it's, it's fantastic. But there's another part of me that said, well, how about taking that 75% towards that power wheelchair and putting it towards rehab that allows that person to become ambulatory. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's that, it's that yeah it's that balance is it you know where do the funds go and mm -hmm. and how are those funds how are those funds utilized and you know if you if you think about the number of persons who are going to have a stroke over the next 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. it's exponential in terms of that and those yeah. people, those people are surviving mm -hmm. because we have, we have much better care now. And so we're going to have lots more people with, with significant disabilities. And what's the economic cost of mm -hmm. putting them in long-term care or, you know, old people's homes or nursing homes or having, you know, personal support workers in, yeah. in the community versus you know goal oriented patient oriented rehabilitation so that they can actually achieve some regain some of their mm -hmm. independence and how does that affect them as individuals as well yeah um, and you know what would be super nice 
it would be super good because we have, I would say, a kind of opposite situation in Brazil. Um, people, people, they do not have access to technology, so they do not have access like to a good wheelchair, not even an, a wheelchair in many, you, you just, you just arrived mm. from Brazil, so you saw our patients, you saw their realities. And many times, very often, I would say, they have like to find their own strength to recover because they are the economically active people in their family or they live in a place where they have to walk to be able to get a bus right. to be able to get so the the old environment can play an important role in helping people to try or force them to try to get a better uh, recovery pathway so that's something would be super nice to figure out mm -hmm. from a research perspective mm -hmm. and i I've, I've discussed this paper maybe a year ago it it emerged from that claiming from who about planning 2030 so they are mm -hmm. planning 2030 and how can and what are the difference of having a stroke and living in india for example mm -hmm. south africa for example, or Canada and mm -hmm. United States. So mm -hmm. they show in the, I can, I can send you this paper. It's so mm -hmm. nice. They show the curve of recovery. And we see here when they live in like high income right. countries and the curve of recover when they live in low income countries or right. middle income countries. So we know that makes a difference mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. where we live so we know economical situations will impact in the sure. development for sure and yeah. we also know that you know your socioeconomic educational status influences the the type of conditions you're going to sustain yeah. as well right yeah. Um, yeah in terms of diet and sleep and stress and and yeah. all those things that affect our health um yeah. they they also they also play into that um mm -hmm. as yeah. well yeah we are approaching the end of our conversation eu só queria saber se vocês querem fazer algum comentário fazer alguma pergunta específica pra gente we have a nice comment here from pablo from costa rica he is mm -hmm. sending his greetings uh we also have fans from Brazil when they attended your course last week and they are super happy to see us here. So Paula, Adriana, Alexandro, they were all like send you some greetings. I can't see any other um, comment or question here. Se vocês tiverem mais um comentário ou alguma pergunta que quiserem colocar, a gente está chegando aí perto do fim. Então, fiquem à vontade para colocar, pode colocar em português e eu traduzo. And I will um, apenas agradecer. Ai, que graça. Obrigada, Sandra. They are they're very thankful for our discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they like and they could like appreciate the, um, the content. So I want to just um, give you the floor to say your final remarks or your final comments the floor is yours well firstly thank you very much for inviting me to to do this with you um it's been a very stimulating conversation thank you That's to it. all my brazilian colleagues um that i met last week and for joining tonight as well as my um fellow colleagues around the world that maybe are on are on this call um i think you you, you know, I, you raise a really important topic in terms of, you know, where are we at with clinical practice and science, and and how can we how can we do do better research and how can we do better clinical practice um, over the next decade or two mm -hmm. decades? Um, because what we talk about now really sets the agenda as we as we move forward. 
Um, and and I think it would be would be great to see um, you know some of the things that we've talked about to have a broader conversation um, and to be you know inclusive of all parties um, so that our research is is able to to do what we need it to do and that is to improve our outcomes for our clients yeah yeah that's that's a great conclusion yeah it was was a great pleasure to have this conversation with you i hope we can do it again yes, in another opportunity. I hope so too. Yeah, yeah. it would be great. I, I told you we wouldn't follow the whole schedule we planned. No. We would go beyond, but it would be better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we've got, we still have a lot of questions that we, uh, we discussed um, that we didn't yeah. even begin to touch on. So um, yeah. it would be good yeah. to uh, maybe tackle some of those as well. Yeah, for sure. Sure. Muito obrigada a todos vocês que estiveram aqui, que acompanharam a nossa conversa. É, é difícil ficar traduzindo, então assim, eu espero que vocês tenham pego o, o, o importante da nossa discussão e também se sintam motivados para estudar inglês, para aprimorarem o inglês de vocês, para poderem acompanhar essa discussão. Thank you so much for all you were here from Argentina, mm -hmm. Costa Rica, um, Canada. Oh, Teresa Golinileu, she's here. Hi, dear. Thank you for all being here and stimulating our discussion. Thank you so much, Julie, and I hope to Thank see you. you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye.